Welcome to this rapid revision video looking at medieval healers. If you've not yet seen my videos on medieval causes of disease, treatments and preventions, you might want to look at these first. However, let's get into it. Firstly, an introduction. Just as today, people became sick in the Middle Ages and they required treatment. The help available largely depended on how rich you were and whether you lived in the town or the countryside, and indeed what was wrong with you. We're going to review the types of help available to people in medieval times, and who could actually help people if they could afford the treatment. Firstly, the most expensive of the lot, and the rarest, the physician, what today we'd probably call a doctor. There were only around 100 physicians in all of England, and all of them were men. They were trained at university medical school for seven years, learning the works of ancient doctors such as Hippocrates and Galen, but also the teachings of Islamic doctors such as Ibn Sina, known as Avicenna in Latin, and Al-Razi, or Razis in Latin. They were banned from dissection and training, so they actually knew very little about the human body and anatomy. They carried a vadamecum, a, a handbook of diagnosis, and they used the four humours, urine charts, and astrology in diagnosis and treatment. That's right, they used astrology, a supernatural idea, but one that to them was pseudoscientific. They used clinical observation, just like Hippocrates, and occasionally they would take the pulse and examine the whole body, although that didn't always uh, catch on. However, they were very expensive. Only the very richest could afford them, and typically they were only found in the towns and cities. Most of the physicians based their main ideas about illness on the ancient ideas of Hippocrates and Galen, including the theory of the four humours. So a person who was thought to be sanguine had too much blood. Physicians regularly performed bloodletting using cuts and even leeches. This was thought to encourage good health even in the already healthy. Doctors used phlebotomy charts to identify where someone should be bled from. Someone who was melancholic might have too much black bile. A laxative medicine might be used, or an enema used to evacuate the humours from the anus. Hmm, nice thought. Similarly, blistering the skin and using purgatives to make people sick were believed to balance the humours too. The theory of opposites was also used, e.g. using hot ingredients to treat chills. However, despite the physician being the most expensive of our healers, it doesn't mean they were necessarily the most effective. Many of their ideas were based upon ancient ideas, which today have been very much disproven, although they were the best medical thinking at the time. They rarely made anyone healthier. Next up, the apothecary. He could still be quite an expensive service, but he was at least cheaper than the physician and so available to more people. The apothecary was trained in herbs and medicines, but had no actual medical qualifications, unlike the physician. Today we might consider this similar to a pharmacist or chemist, but without all the skills and qualifications that go with that today. The apothecary would mix various ingredients to produce medicines for the physicians a little bit like a prescription, but they also made up their own mixtures for a price. They were cheaper than having to consult a physician, however, which made them more accessible to ordinary people, and they would almost certainly be a man. They were most common in the towns and cities rather than in the villages. Then we have the barber surgeon. They were not trained or really respected by the physicians, but if they were literate, they may have read a few books. However, they had lots of experience and may have learnt their trade from another barber surgeon, almost like an apprentice. They could do basic surgery. They could pull out teeth, let blood, lance boils. They could also remove some tumours, especially external ones. They could also provide hair and beard trims, which is why we get the barber today with that sort of service. They could do basic surgery such as amputating limbs, although the success of this was not exactly guaranteed. Speed was valued over caution. There was no anaesthetics or antiseptics, so a very low success rate for surgery. About 50% is the best you could hope for for any sort of um, amputation, possibly even less. However, they were the cheapest surgery available, and mostly available in the towns. As a bit of a fun fact for you, the pole that is still displayed outside modern day barber's shops is medieval in origin, and it represents the bloody bandages of the barber's work. After all, people back then were largely illiterate, so they needed some way of knowing where the barber sur surgeon had set up shop. Another common type of healer who was accessible to most people was the wise woman. Firstly, she was wise. And secondly, she was a woman. And if you're a Blackadder fan, you'll get the reference. The wise woman could train to be a midwife, with the bishop's permission. She could qualify as a surgeon too, but she was not allowed to be a physician or to attend university. Wise women could be either rich or poor. 
they often help with childbirth as a local midwife, learning by experience. They also use some herbal remedies, and some charms and spells possibly, although this could carry the risk of accusations of witchcraft. Then the quacks. I'll first of all point out that these became more prominent in the Renaissance and the early modern periods, so do not really focus on them too much with the medieval period. But as access to ingredients increased and travel became easier, they, they became far more prominent in later periods. They often worked a bit like a travelling salesman. They offered all sorts of cure-all remedies or panaceas, but these were usually either useless or just common herbal medicines. They were untrained and unqualified. They liked to boast about the exotic nature of many of their cures, but few worked. But they were cheaper than the physician, and so this was, was something that people might resort to if they couldn't afford anything better. They often had a bad reputation, though, ripping people off and then moving on before anyone could get after them. Some final points, then, about the main healers that we've looked at within this rapid revision video. Just as today, medieval people had options of who to see if they became sick. Physicians were qualified doctors who based most of their treatments on the work of Hippocrates, Galen and Ibn Sina. Only the riches could afford their fees. Apothecaries prepared various medicines of varying effectiveness. Barber surgeons performed basic surgery. Anything more ambitious, such as amputations, was very risky. The wise women used their experience to provide smaller communities with medicines and midwifery. Quacks were more active later on, but provided medicines of questionable effectiveness. But most people relied on remedies at home, where women had the role of healers, using skills and treatments passed down through the generations. I go into this in a little bit more detail in my video on treatments, so if you want to have some more information about that, you could always check out that video. The fact was, though, paying for your treatment did not necessarily make it more effective. In fact, sometimes the exact opposite could be true. So, finding a healer was definitely possible in the Middle Ages, but the effectiveness of their cures... Well, that left a lot to be decided very often, but it was all based upon the best medical science available at the time. That's the end of this rapid revision video. I hope it's been useful to you. If it has, please drop the video a like and subscribe for more content like this. Thanks very much for watching and good health.